Hey, today we're going to be talking about our relationship with God. You probably heard somebody like me tell you that God wants to have that personal relationship with you. But the question is, what kind of relationship? Like a parent-child type of relationship? Or is it like an employer-employee type of relationship? I, I heard this one person say, whatever God tells us to do, whether we like it or not, we have to do it. And there's some merit to that. But is that really the kind of relationship that God desires? I mean, at the core. Years ago, there was a famous sermon that was preached called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I mean, is that the kind of relationship that God wants us to have in mind every time we go to Him in prayer? I've heard of people who are always starting their prayers with, I am so sorry. I mean, is that the kind of relationship God wants with us? So we're going to be looking at a chunk of Luke chapter 18 today. And in that chunk, we're going to find two interactions that Jesus has. The first interaction, we discover the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. And the second section, we're going to discover the kind of relationship that God doesn't want us to have with Him. And you're going to notice that the second section is significantly longer than the first part because in studying the kind of relationship that He doesn't want us to have, we actually get a clearer idea of how He wants us to relate with Him. So let's take a look at today's passage, Luke chapter 18, starting from verse 15. This is this. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for Him to place His hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuke them. Now, this is a really interesting passage because immediately we think that disciples are bad guys. I mean, who would say, don't bring a baby to Jesus, right? But we have to understand the cultural context. 2,000 years ago, men were not supposed to be taking care of babies. That was the role of women. Because the role of a man, especially an important person like Jesus, he was supposed to be occupying his time doing things that's, that actually mattered. He was supposed to spend his time with people who are worthy in that society. And just so you know, back in those days, people who were deemed worthy were people who basically contributed to society, and a baby is not one of them. So the disciples are basically saying, babies need to stay out of Jesus' way because Jesus has more important things to do. So let's see how Jesus responds to them. Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. In a way, Jesus is saying, take a look at the way that they behave. Look at the way that they trust their parents. Look at the way that they see the world because that's the kind of outlook you need to have, disciples, if you want to be a part of this kingdom movement. So for those of you who have babies or you've been around a lot of babies, think about a way that a baby sees the world. They immediately trust their caretakers. They never think, oh, so-and-so is holding out on me. You see, babies are a perfect reflection of Adam and Eve before sin entered the world. They were in a relationship with God and they had nothing to worry about. They trusted God. They never even questioned Him. Until one day, Eve started to think that maybe God is holding out on her. Maybe God told me not to eat that fruit because He doesn't want the best for me. You see, babies feel like everything's going to be just fine without any proof. And so Jesus says, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, you have to automatically believe that God is on your side. You see, but you and I, we've been around the block a few times. We've lived long enough to know that you can't just blindly put your trust in somebody. But Jesus says, if you want to know what kind of relationship God is seeking, it's the kind of a baby and a parent. Okay, next Jesus goes on to his next interaction, an interaction that demonstrates the kind of relationship that God is not looking for. So let's start in verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if that didn't make sense to you because it sounded too religious, let me rephrase that for you. He's saying, what do I have to do to have that right and perfect relationship with God? Now, before you move on, ask yourself, if somebody were to ask you, how do I have that perfect relationship with God? How would you answer it? Now, keep that in mind. And now let's take a look at how Jesus answers that question. He says this, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, that's a very unordinary answer to a very straightforward question. 
But the reason why Jesus responds with this weird question is because he's trying to expose an assumption that the ruler made that was way off base. Notice that the questioner asks, what must I do? The assumption that this ruler is making is that God is desiring a relationship of basically a lawmaker and a law abider. Tell me what to do, God, and I will make sure I get it done. So this is why Jesus says the next line. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Now, what is Jesus saying here? He's not saying, have you followed these commands? Because if you follow them perfectly, then you get to be in perfect relationship with God. No, instead, Jesus is playing his game. He's saying, if that's how you see God and humanity, if, you, if that's how you see that relationship, then let's play that game for a few seconds. Jesus is playing along with this ruler saying, let's see how well you do at your own game. So the guy, he responds to Jesus by saying this, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. He's saying, oh goody, we're playing this game of how well I could follow the rules. Well, I wanna let you know, ever since I was this tall, I've been following every single rule. And so Jesus plays along. Oh goody, okay, you passed level one, let's go on to level two. This is level two. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. So Jesus is saying, well, if that's what you think God wants from us, then here, here are some more rules you should follow. Now I'm convinced that if this man went home and sold everything on eBay and gave it to the poor and then said, Jesus, I did everything you told me to do. I passed level two. I'm convinced that Jesus would have said, okay, great, here's level three. You know how in the Bible it says, don't murder anybody? Well, if you like following rules, here's the next level of that commandment. Don't ever hate anybody. You know how the rule says that you can't commit adultery with other people? Well, here's the next level version of that. Don't look at anybody with a lustful eye. You know how in your tradition it says that you're supposed to forgive certain people a certain amount of times? Well, here's the next level of that. Forgive infinitely. You see, this man is discovering that if my relationship with God is dependent on how well I could follow the rules, then I'm gonna fall short every single time. And so the question still stands, what kind of relationship does God really want with humanity? And the answer is this, God wants to have a marriage relationship with humanity. Now, if you read through all of Jesus' teachings, you'll come to that same conclusion. I mean, imagine today, I went to Val and said, can you just tell me the things I need to do to let you know that I'm still married to you? And as soon as I check off all those things on that list, I say, okay, see ya, and go do my own thing. You see, Jesus knew right away that this man was looking for a checklist. And so Jesus decided to insert something in that list, something that he couldn't just check off and go back to living the way that he was already living. If on the list you have something that says, do not commit adultery, you could check that off and go live the life apart from God that you always lived. But if on that list it says, sell all your belongings and give to the poor, if you were to check that off, you can't go back to the life you were already living. Jesus intentionally asked him to do something that would change his life drastically. And Jesus really, really, really wanted to break that paradigm. And that's why he gave him this really, really harsh command. And then in response, verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. So, so far, Jesus is saying two things. Number one, be like a baby who is always depending on God. And secondly, don't reduce this relationship down to a bunch of do's and don'ts. And then he continues his teaching in verse 24. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Here, Jesus is talking about a person who's in right standing with God. He's in such a good relationship with him that your hearts are connected. So when God looks at something and breaks his heart, your heart breaks also. Or if you see something that needs to be done, you're doing it because you assume that that's what God would do if he were here right now. Now, when we look through the scriptures, we know that God is a generous God. And for that reason, you also ought to be a generous person. So with a little humor, Jesus says, it's easier for a big camel to walk through a small eye of a needle than it is for a person who's attached to his wealth to be generous. Imagine if you who want to be a parent come to me and say, hey, Kotz, I want to be a parent. I already bought my minivan. I got a, a stroller. I got a crib. I got my registry done at Babies R Us. What must I do to become a parent? Now, knowing that being a parent is more than just checking things off a list and owning the right things, I turn to you and I say, this is what I want you to do. 
I want you to go to sleep tonight at 10 o'clock and then wake yourself up at 12.30, midnight, and then stay up for 30 minutes and go back to sleep. And then at 3.30, I want you to wake up again and stay up for 30 minutes and go to sleep. And then at five in the morning, I want you to do the same thing. And then again at seven o'clock. Now you being a person who values uninterrupted sleep, you go home sad because you realize that, that you can't commit to doing that. The point I was trying to make there was, if you are really attached to sleep, a good night's rest, and you're not willing to let go of that for any reason in this world, then you are not ready to be a parent. Being a parent is not just a list of things to do, it's a lifestyle. If you aren't willing to be inconvenienced day in and day out, then you don't understand what it means to be a parent. If you're not willing to put yourself second to somebody else's well-being, you are not ready to be a parent. Likewise, Jesus is saying, if you aren't willing to be inconvenienced by me, then you are not ready to have that relationship with God. Now, the people who are standing around this rich young ruler are now starting to freak out. So those who heard this, they, they asked, who then can be saved? Which means, who can have that relationship with God? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What that means is, if you stick with me, if you have that relationship with me, I will start to transform you from the inside out. What you thought is something you can't let go, like your wealth or your comfort, eventually you'll become the kind of person that is willing to let things go for the sake of wanting to become more like the Father. Then in verse 28, Peter said to Jesus, we have left all we had to follow you. Jesus, we already gave up everything to follow you. You are one of the most wanted men in Israel right now. And because we're associated with you, we are losing family members. They don't want to be associated with us anymore. We have lost our land. Haven't we proven to you that we are willing to let go of everything in our lives to be in relationship with you? Then Jesus responds with this. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Now what Jesus just said here is a message of hope. He's saying one day this movement is gonna become big. And I understand you give up a lot to be a part of this movement. But as you lose your family members, and we don't want that to happen to anybody, I want you to know that you're gonna be surrounded by people who you will call family. If your family abandons you, you will have another family waiting right here called the church to embrace you. Now in the first few years after this Jesus movement started, there's a whole group of people who call themselves Christians who basically said, everything we own actually belongs to God. And so however God wants us to use his stuff, we wanna be generous with it. And so if you lost your land, there's a group of people who are saying, if you need a place to stay, you could always come stay with us because that's what God would want us to do. If you are hungry, you could come over here because I will feed you because that's what God would want me to do. If you need somebody to listen to your story, or if you need some healing, if you need someone to be on your side, I'm willing to be that person because that's what Jesus would do for me. So in summary, this is what Jesus is saying. God wants to have a relationship with you, but not just any relationship. He wants to have that relationship like a marriage relationship where you completely trust each other where your relationship is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. A relationship where your attachment to other things like your wealth doesn't get in the way. What God wants from you, from us, is a marriage relationship. He wants to call us his bride. He wants to put us first, and in return, he wants us to put him first. So brothers and sisters, may our relationship with God be founded on unconditional commitment. And may we let go of any attachments, any other allegiances that might keep us away from having that intimate relationship with God. And may we all experience heaven together. God bless you.